Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm delighted to be here and for one reason, uh, and I thank you for being here because your enthusiasm for literacy will uh, really make the difference for kids in your schools. So here's the agenda for today. I'm gonna talk at you for a little while and talk about an overview of the model. It's the Taking Action Leadership Model and where it came from and all the parts and pieces. So I'm gonna talk through the components of the model first. And then I'm going to introduce you to a five-stage process for developing, implementing, and monitoring a literacy action plan in your school. Then we're gonna actually break into groups, and I think I've talked to most of you about where we need to move the tables to, and actually go through the rubrics that we have posted around. And then I'd like to bring you back together and talk about the later stages after you have goals and an action plan, how that plays out in a school. And then I'd like for you to spend some time planning for what you wanna do with the rest of the summer, what you wanna do with your action plan when you uh, go back to school in, in the fall. Now I know that we have a couple of intact literacy teams and I mean intact, I mean uh, formally appointed literacy teams. And we have other teams that are here as representatives of the school. So just know that your conversations, while will be fruitful, will be a little bit different. So those people that are a formal literacy team, you can actually go through the process today and set goals for your school, or you can make plans for how you're gonna go through the process with other people back at your school to go, go through the goal setting process. Okay, does that make sense? This is the leadership, the taking action leadership model. And um, let me just kind of explain the components and then we'll go through one at a time. You'll notice that there's three circles. So if you think about the three circles as a bullseye, smack dab in the center of the bullseye is student motivation, engagement, and achievement. And that's the focus of all of our work, all of our work, and all of our, my team's work. Around the outside is where literacy happens for kids, and so it happens for kids across the content areas, and it happens for kids during literacy interventions, and literacy interventions are those particular programs that you have in your schools that serve the needs of kids who are struggling readers and writers. And then around the outside, it's supported, literacy is supported by a literacy-rich school environment, by interaction and involvement with parents and community members, and support from the district level office. So those are our six goal areas of the model. One, two, three, four, five, six. And uh, we've written a rubric for each one of those goal areas. And I'll talk about the rubrics and how you can use those a little bit later. <clears throat> the star points are what we call action points of the model. And action points are what leaders need to know and be able to do in order to implement a literacy-rich program in a middle or high school. And so they need to develop and implement a plan. They need to support teachers to improve instruction. They need to use data to make decisions. They need to build leadership capacity, and they need to allocate resources for a literacy improvement effort. So that's the whole kind of total picture of the model. And uh, then we're gonna go through each of the components um, one by one. Where did this model come from? It grew out of the work of myself and my colleagues about, for about the last decade. And I was about five years ago, I was fortunate enough to receive a grant from the Carnegie Corporation. And the Carnegie Corporation has funded lots of areas around the country and lots of projects around the country that focus on adolescent literacy. And so they knew that they needed a piece to it that was a leadership model that dealt with school-wide change. My degree and all my writing and all of my uh, research is in adolescent literacy. But interestingly enough, I teach in a department of educational leadership. My, my degree is in adolescent literacy. My teaching is in a, uh, educational leadership. And so what that has given me is a lens for school-wide change. Most ad adolescent literacy people think teacher kid or kid text. And very few people think about what are the school structures that need to be in place 
to actually affect change, and not only affect change for kids, to, but to make sure that that change is sustainable and continues for kids and becomes part of the very culture of the school. And so uh, I was given a grant to develop a leadership model for improving adolescent literacy. So I started with interviewing principals who had led successful efforts to improve literacy around the country. And I began taking notes about what they said. What are the, I, I said, basically, what did you do? And I began taking notes about what are the essential elements to improve literacy in a school-wide change effort. And uh, so we developed this model. And when you look at the model, you say, oh, yeah, that belongs. Oh, yeah, that's there. But it really did take about five years for me to draw and conceptualize this model with the help of lots of other um, colleagues. Who is the audience for this model? The audience is state-level leaders as they think about improving adolescent literacy. And I will say that if you haven't seen a copy of your Wisconsin state literacy plan, how many of you have seen this? Uh, it's really a fabulous document. And I don't know if there are other states that have a plan for adolescent literacy, but in my opinion, not as good as this one. This is a very good plan. Uh, it was put together by a task force uh, about a couple of years ago with DPI. And the task force then uh, studied adolescent literacy in different realms. Uh, they actually took key documents in adolescent literacy that most of them have come out in the last five to seven years and actually jigsawed uh, these documents. They all read uh, the content area literacy document and came up with the components of the state adolescent literacy plan. And so I wanted you to know about it. I'm sure that you can get it on a PDF from the DPI website. It's worth looking at because uh, the state has, the state of Wisconsin has made a commitment to supporting this particular document in terms of how it rolls out in your schools. So you'll probably want to align whatever you do with your plan and whatever you do with your goals, both at the district level and at the school level with this uh, document. So the second audience for the model are district level leaders, folks like uh, reading coordinators, special educators, and anybody else in central administration. Because what we have found is that school-based literacy plans implemented are really good, and that's where the work needs to happen. But those plans can be more sustainable if they have a district support. So one of the things that we're working with with our district component is what, do, what can districts do to support the literacy improvement efforts of school-based folks? And then the last people are school leaders. And school leaders we define broadly. Everyone in this room is a school leader. And so if you're a member of a literacy team, if you are a curriculum coordinator, a reading specialist, a literacy coach, anybody in administration, you, a department chair, a team leader, you are a school leader. And so when we say school leaders, we're not just talking administrators, we're talking about all of the teacher leaders that are absolutely essential for adding to the uh, effort of the school. So this is the, these are the three products that came out of the literacy, the uh, Carnegie grant. So the model informs all three products. And so the first one is taking action. Some of you have probably seen this book. This is the, the first book that describes the model. And there's actually a chapter on each one of the components of the model. This was published by ASCD in 2007. And I'll refer to parts and pieces of both books because um, there are parts and pieces that you can use back at your school sites uh, for various reasons. The second uh, book is called Meeting the Challenge of Adolescent Literacy. And this was published by International Reading Association, just came out last October. What we did for this book is we identified 16 critical issues in adolescent literacy. And then we used the action points of the model to address those issues. There are issues like, how do you get students to engage in reading and writing and turn in assignments? How do you uh, implement a literacy improvement effort that's sustainable when key people leave? How do you get everyone on board uh, with a literacy improvement effort? What does content area literacy look like in the different content areas? So we, we identified 16, 16 issues 
and address them with the models, uh, the points of the model. And uh, so this book is all about implementation. So as you, and there's also 28 tools in the back of this book that I'll refer to that you can use at various points of your implementation. So the last piece is what I'm going to be talking about uh, later on this morning and this afternoon. So the last piece is going to be called Taking the Lead on Adolescent Literacy, and it's going to be a book that's going to be published by Corwin Press, and it's due August 15th. An excellent teacher without a well-coordinated program can do only so much. In these situations, even the best of teachers can offer students only isolated moments of engrossed learning and rich experience in an otherwise disconnected series of classes. This is the literacy engagement instruction cycle that we talk about in the Taking Action book. Basically, we want to make sure that we improve student competence, competence, and efficacy. And efficacy is the sense that kids can tackle a situation and they can complete it successfully. That's our goal. And how do we do that? We have to engage them in tasks that are meaningful and purposeful. And I will say that they have to be meaningful and purposeful to them and not just to us. So one of the major things we ought to be doing for kids is helping them set uh, a purpose for reading that makes sense to them. And then here's the really tough part, and that's where you come in. How do we do that? We do that by providing instruction, modeling, and guided practice of literacy support in context. And that's where the strategies come in. That's where um, the support, the modeling, and the guided practice and that's where teachers come in. And I will say this isn't easy. This is not an easy task for students, I mean for teachers, uh, because you have to practice and you have to become comfortable with uh, offering that guided practice and modeling for students. If you think about adolescent needs, which I'm sure you do every single day, uh, because they pretty much present themselves to you every single day, um, think about these categories of, uh, of adolescent needs. Autonomy, technology media, the need to be heard, the need to debate, uh, need to make a difference, need to belong, and a sense of accomplishment. Talk at your tables and pick two things at your school that you think you do particularly well, and pick one thing that you think you might do better at your school. Take a minute and talk to your table mates, and then I'll signal you when it's time to come back. I think when you look at if it's adolescent literacy, what are the, the kids, what are the student needs, is that we are actually giving them the opportunity to, whether it's using it as a tool or showing their knowledge via technology. I think that's a whole different what the project that you just did. That's not really increasing their skills in any way, shape, or form. So I think that we need to think about what kinds of projects are we doing where, and how do those projects build together so that kids are learning different kinds of skills. And I'm worried that we're not always looking at the literacy involved in technology. How to read in these tasks, how to read a computer website, how to, how to really evaluate it. I think we're taking it at a surface level right now, but getting in at a surface level, at least we're starting to get in. And we've had a couple of discussions about is literacy the overarching okay, summarize your conversation, and technology you is a tool and a step stone to those literacies? I thought our other one was needing to be heard. Okay, so I suspect there are times when your kids read text and they don't have any more clue about what they're reading than you did. They can answer some questions, but they're really not understanding it. Take a moment and talk to your table mates about what do you need to do to scaffold it so kids can actually deeply understand text and not just fly through on the surface. Take a moment and talk about that, if you will. There's so much that the students could get if they just knew what that word meant. And so anytime we're going to read something, we'll preview what the key vocabulary is going to be before we begin, and that seems to make a big difference teaching them to look at text features to find out what is friendly about this text, what does this text include that's going to help me navigate and get more meaning as I go. Bring the background. 
background knowledge. What background knowledge say. does a student need to be able to approach this text and make it meaningful so that they do have a purpose in reading it that isn't just my purpose? But I think that's part of the difficulty. I had no background knowledge mm -hmm. about what this was, and I think that oftentimes that's the way that kids approach a piece of text. They have no, especially science, surely. I, I find that when the kids are reading the biology text, they're often yeah. struggling because so much of the vocabulary is it's unfamiliar. Uh -huh. And unless I have a picture or a background experience with it, I don't know what it means either. You know? Well, then the problem with vocabulary okay. ways in okay. biology, Multiple okay. multiple so words like for one example. idea, right? Because yeah. even yeah. You, as teachers, you guys, if they even have different science teachers, they may have mastered that concept with this set of vocabulary, but now it's a different set of vocabulary. And the, and the whole science pedagogy thing of do we do the inquiry to understand the concepts first and then attach the vocabulary to the concepts? Because that's against the pedagogy of other content areas. I mean, English doesn't do it that way. I don't know why. I'm not sure how we do it. I, I think it was, I was, maybe it was, I don't remember if I was talking to Chris or her team a few weeks ago about um, sometimes it's hard to get into the vocabulary or the vernacular of the subject when the, u the words they're using to get those new vocabulary words across are the words that the students are struggling with. Right. When we talk about literacy across the content area, we need to ask the right question. The question is not, are you a teacher of reading? The question is, however, how will students become better readers, writers, speakers, and thinkers of this content, whatever it might be, as a result of being in your class? And so we're not asking teachers to take their content and put it aside and teach reading. Reading is a process. You have to read about something, you have to write about something, you have to think about something, and the something is content whether it's art, music, history, biology, literature, whatever the content may be, you have to read and write and think about something. And so uh, the key issue here is to help content area teachers to integrate the literacy and learning together. We want kids to learn. We want them to also be able to access text by themselves and learn those uh, strategy support so that they can be independent learners. I'm going to talk only briefly about literacy interventions because it's a whole other topic. But literacy interventions answers the questions, how do we help kids one to two years below grade level in reading and writing? How do we help kids that are three or more years below grade level in reading and writing but are able to decode and have a basic sight vocabulary? How do we help students that still need assistance with basic fluency? and phonics, and how do we help special education and ELL students? Those are the major questions, and th that's another conversation that needs to happen at your district and at your school, and I'm not minimizing it. I'm just, I chose to focus more on literacy across the content areas uh, for this particular day. The other piece to literacy-rich environment is that we need to think about what are the policies and procedures and schedules that make a literacy-rich activity part of the very nature of the structure of the school and the culture of the school. I was working with a literacy team and a middle school English language arts teacher raised her hand and said, I'm going to do the word of the week. And I'll put work uh, book pages and I'll put uh, activity sheets in the teacher's mailboxes and I will get on the intercom, and I will announce the word. And everybody was like, that's great, Lynn. I said, Lynn, that is wonderful that you volunteered to do that. Who's going to do that for kids if you move to Istanbul? And so think about the literacy initiatives in your school. And are they dependent on one person doing them? Or are they part of somebody's job description? Are they part of the schedule? And do they become part of the culture of the school? And so think about the initiatives that have come and gone in your school. They go because sometimes one person takes it with them. And so we need to think about what we can do at our school that makes the literacy initiative sustainable when key people leave. Parents and community members are an important part of them, and involving them in a meaningful way can add a lot of uh, depth to your literacy initiative. 
So the goal of content area literacy is to improve student content literacy and learning, uh, progress as a reader writer, and help them with content learning at the same time. So then the question becomes, how do you get more column B teaching? And so we have to develop teachers by professional learning communities. And one of the things that we found in our work to be most powerful was making the work public. And by that we mean teachers opening their doors. So I'm working with uh, some different kinds of graphic organizers in a social studies class. And I'm getting pretty good at using graphic organizers to stimulate higher order thinking with kids. That means that I could say, third period, I'd be willing to demonstrate this. And if anybody on their planning period wants to come in and see this, I'd be happy to do that. And the literacy coach could then can sit down the next hour and talk to those folks about what they saw. That doesn't mean I'm an expert on every strategy, but I've gotten pretty good at graphic organizers. And maybe you've gotten really good at QAR and science and getting kids to identify different kinds of levels of questions in science. So she's a resource for the school. So this does not always take the form of going to a professional development session, learning a strategy, and then trying to do it. It can also be finding the resources within your school and how can you make those available uh, to other people in the school. Literacy coaching is certainly an important piece and teacher professional development. We need to get everyone on board. And so you may hear something like, I wasn't hired to teach reading. I teach. Why didn't they teach them to read during the elementary grades? I don't know how to teach reading. They are already taking a, a reading class. We tried those things, and they don't work. I don't have time to teach reading. I teach my content. There is a resistors chart <laughs> in this book. And it's on page 196 and 7. And we, I believe that, there's not, that there is not one teacher in this entire universe that doesn't want kids to learn. But they might be feeling, what we did was we listed eight different reasons why teachers might resist. And so they might resist because they feel overwhelmed. That could happen, especially in May, right? They might feel fearful. I don't know how to do this. They might think, this too shall pass. In the chart, in the Taking Action book, we talk about the reasons for um, resistance and the messages they need to hear. So if that's something that you are encountering as a literacy team, you might want to take a look at that chart and say, how do we help teachers move to being non-resistors, and what messages do they need to hear? These are the seven different kinds of data that you have available to you in your school. And we'll talk about that in terms of the stages and helping people use data to make decisions. But it's a key piece in helping, especially the resistors, see who needs literacy support and uh, where do we need to put our focus. Building leadership capacity has a couple of uh, key points. One is that everyone in a school has a role to play. So the content area teachers need to know what their role is. Administrators need to know what their roles are. Literacy coaches, curriculum coaches, special ed, ELL teachers, the library meeting specialists, uh, department or chairs or team leaders, and content area teachers. It's important that each person know what their role is in the literacy improvement effort. And then the second piece is building a literacy team. And we have found in our work that a literacy team is a good vehicle for helping um, initiate, develop, and implement a literacy action plan in a school. And this should not be the committee du jour. This should be a, a team that's representative of the entire school community. So anyone in the school could say, Mrs. Joan rese Jones represents me. It should be each content area, not each content area, but uh, at least the core content areas, plus unified arts, plus special ed, plus ELL. Um, some teams have a student representative. Some te teams have a parent representative. 
and at least one administrator on the team. And so the literacy team can be an excellent vehicle for uh, disseminating the work, identifying the work, and communicating with faculty. The biggest resource that you will have trouble with is time, right? What do you need time for? You need time for literacy team meetings. You need time for assessment. You need time for grade level and content area meetings. You need time for teachers to embed literacy support strategies. And, and you need time for kids to read and write. The, uh, the statistics on how much kids read and write during a school day are just appalling. But they're never going to get better, better at reading and writing unless they have time to read and write. And then a schedule that's conducive to literacy support. The other allocating of resources are space, personnel, materials and technology, professional development, and funding. So those are all kind of the resource pieces. And I've talked through the pieces of the model. Take a minute and talk to your table mates about the, the action points pieces of using data, supporting teachers, building capacity, allocating resources. We'll talk about a plan later and how that plays out in your school. Somebody like Ms. Bazala, who's a math teacher, she, will she be motivated enough, interested enough, find value in this enough to then become a part of the team? Because I think that's huge. Like someone like Julie, who's a science teacher, and then the key role that they'll play in getting their department members invested in understanding why this is valuable is huge. One of the things that the book talks about is growing leadership, because none of this stuff is going to happen unless we grow leadership. It's, it's interesting that that's, and I, Barner and I mentioned this, that there are certain people that do, but you're also, when you're saying, when you're doing this, you have to be able to say, I might not know it all, and it's okay to ask, and I don't know if everybody is comfortable with it yet, with it. So here's the five-stage process, and if you look at page 16 in your handouts, the five-stage process is, presented a little more linearly. But this is a five-stage process for developing, implementing, and monitoring a literacy action plan in an upper elementary, middle, or high school. So stage one is get your literacy improvement underway. So for this piece, I'm going to talk about what you maybe have done. I'm going to ask you, I'm going to talk through the three parts here and show you some examples. And then I'm going to ask you to talk in table groups about what you've done in your school to get ready for your literacy initiative. And you'll all be at different points here. You may say, we've already done this. We're ready to go on to, to uh, put together a plan. We might even have pieces of your plan. Wherever you are in this process is fine. We can move forward, OK? So I'm going to talk about stage one and what we recommend in stage one. You might even have other things to add to it. Stage one has three pieces to it. Build your literacy um, leadership team. Create a vision for a literacy-rich school and establish and communicate the need for literacy improvement. So the per first piece has to do with what I talked about before in terms of building your literacy team. Some people call them literacy commissions. Some people call it le uh, reading leadership team. Um, I kind of prefer literacy team because it broadens it beyond just reading so that you can talk about writing, learning, thinking. But the literacy team should be representative of the entire school community, as I mentioned before. I think I have a handout towards the end of your packet on functions of a literacy team. And that is on page 36. So you might think about those things. We won't stop and talk about them. But you might think about those themes of who's going to uh, function as a team leader? Who will function as a team facilitator? One of the models that we've seen that works pretty well is a, having a team leader and a team facilitators that don't necessarily have to be the same person. 
So a team leader is the person that puts the meetings together. They're the contact person for the district. Uh, they're a liaison person usually to the district. Uh, they may be kind of the official person that can work with Im administration. And then we have, you can have a team facilitator. So today I'm going to ask each team to appoint a facilitator and you can rotate that facilitator uh, person. So at each meeting, you can have a different facilitator. And the, the facilitator role is just one that gets things going, keeps the discussion moving, and makes sure that everybody is uh, adhering to the ground rules. So each team should come up with your own ground rules. What are your ground rules for operating with each other? Second one has to do with creating a school vision. It's important that, uh, and, and we, we happen to do this through the vignette that's in the Taking Action book. I also have a two-page version of the middle and the high school that you're welcome to. Uh, but what we find that's easiest to do is to uh, have people read through the vignette and then underline what in that vignette makes that school literacy rich. These are not case studies, they're, actual, they're not actual schools, but there's nothing in that vignette that doesn't occur somewhere in some school. The point is that you have to do something to make your school literacy rich. It doesn't just happen. And so reading that vignette gets the discussion away from what kids don't do and what somebody else didn't do and onto what is possible at your school. The third piece of, of uh, stage one is actually establishing the need with the faculty. And this can be done in several ways. The first way, because if individual faculty members, especially those who may resist the literacy improvement effort, if they don't see why we're doing this, then they're not going to participate. So one way is to look at the data and to look at the data having to do with student achievement and particular how subgroups are um, achieving. And we do it in a very simple way. We do a sentence frame. Although something good, we still need to work on something else. So this is what one school came up with. Although our reading proficiency of, is above the state average, we need better skills for all, for all and interventions for struggling readers. Although our raw scores are good, we need to work on our subgroups because this happened to be a school where there were real differences in subgroups in terms of reading achievement. Although we have 37 and 47 percent, we need to raise the bar for all students. Although our data looks good, and this particular school, their boys were really doing poorly. So it helped them focus on particular areas that they needed to think about as they developed their goals and their action plans. So the data is one important piece. And here are, again, the seven types of data that are available to you in whatever form you present that to the rest of the faculty or, and certainly the literacy team should take a look at that first. The other piece having to do with uh, establishing the need is to talk a little bit about what are the 21st century literacy skills? What, why, we just can't afford not to address literacy in our schools because kids are going to be able to, going to have to be able to be literate in all kinds of different ways. So part of establishing the need is helping teachers understand the kind of literacy that kids need to interact with in order to be successful when they graduate and uh, enter the workforce or college or just as a citizen. And so what some faculties do is they actually put together a little PowerPoint of 21st century skills and what kids need to be literate in the 21st century. And if you want a good resource for that, NCTE, National Councils for the Teachers of English, have come up with like six different bullet points of 21st century skills and what kids are going to have to do in terms of literacy. So the third piece here, the third piece here is establishing a need with the faculty. So I'd like you to take some time in your group and talk about 
what do we need to do to get ready for the, what, what do we need to do to get the rest of the faculty ready for a literacy initiative to get it underway? <coughs> and what have we already done? And you, what you've already done might not even be on my list, okay? So what you're doing is you're kind of analyzing stage one. The first thing that we ask you to do is think about the strengths of your school. Every school has strengths. And so we talk about, we ask people to identify what the strengths of your school are, and then ask the question, how can you leverage the strengths of your school for a literacy initiative? Secondly, we advocate branding the effort. And so one of the things I'd like for you to talk about today <coughs> is how can you brand your literacy effort in your school? What would be something you would be proud to have in your school? What would be something you want your kids saying and knowing? If you've ever been involved in writing a mission statement, you know that you can get involved with a bunch of words and a bunch of statements that sometimes don't mean much to most people. A brand statement is clean and simple and direct. So uh, they had, and uh, what most schools do is get kids involved with the brand statement. So this was a poster contest for the um, gateway, the books are the gateway to our future, and that was the grand prize winner. And another school out in Colorado, an eighth grader actually, came up with this, and they have a middle school and a high school campus that are right close together. And so the middle school's brand statement is, I read, I write, I learn. They have this on a huge banner. This is a huge banner uh, hanging down as soon as you enter the school. The high school, then took that brand statement and added, I achieve and I graduate. Then we ask you to again summarize the data, and I talked about that, and then assess your goals and come up with goal statements. Let me just show you what the process is so that you can have a visual image of it, and then during break time I'm going to ask you to break into groups and actually situate yourself in the rooms that you'll be uh, working in for the rest of the day. So we have six literacy rubrics, one for each goal area. And we sometimes, when we work with literacy teams for two days, we say, which rubrics would you like to work on? Almost always, they choose student motivation across the content area and literacy-rich environment. If you don't feel comfortable about your literacy intervention uh, program, you might want to tackle that one as well. Then we ask people to say, to come up with need areas, and then say, how feasible are those need areas? So we ask them to rate the need areas, and I'll take you through this process as we go. How feasible are they? So then the last thing is drafting goals, and we'll talk a little bit later about what makes a good goal statement and then we move from goal statements into an, a literacy action plan. Okay, so that's kind of stage two. Stage three has to do with action plan. Stage four has to do with implementation. And stage five then has to do with revising and going back to your action plan and revising and rolling it out for the next year. So here's what's going to happen. I'm going to give you instructions about how to fill out the rubric, and you will do that individually. Okay, so you individually fill out the rubric. When you are finished filling out the rubric, you will grasp the pen, the marker, and you will, mark, you will go to the rubric, and you will actually put a tick mark that represents your assessment of that component. And so you'll just, when you finish, you'll just grab the marker and go up and just put a tick mark under all six of the sections uh, that represents your assessment of the component. Now, you will notice that there might be four different focus points in the component. You're not going to do it individually. You're going to look at all four and say, I think that my assessment of the component is 2.5 based on all four of those focus points, okay? So you're assessing the component, not each. Although you're putting a check mark by each focus point, you're going to kind of put those together and come up with a group, uh, your own assessment of that component, okay? 
So the first thing you need to do is everybody individually needs to read from left to right, which is, unless you're Chinese, normally how you do it. Um, and you're going to put a, a check mark in the focus point that you think represents the implementation of your school. Now, I know that not all of you are in every single classroom. So again, if you will think you're assessing what you know about the school. So individually, you'll go by and you'll put a check mark about what you, where you think the true assessment of your school is. When you're finished with that, you go up to your particular um, rubric on the wall, and you uh, put a check mark into the component that represents your assessment of the school. Is that clear? After that time, when everybody's done, I will model how to facilitate the consensus uh, discussion over here at Middleton High. OK? OK, so this is Middleton High School. Yeah. What's your mascot? Who's your mascot? Home of the Cardinals, right? OK, so this is the Middleton High School literacy team. And so what you've just done is you have individually uh, assessed your school on the rubric, and you've looked at um, each individual focus point within a component, and then ranked it. And then I've asked you to come and put all of your tick marks up here on the group rubric. So now it's time to have a consensus discussion on these six components of the rubric. Now when we do that, um, there's two purposes for that. One is so that you hear about the larger represent representation of the school. We know that you don't know everything about the school, so this is your opportunity to learn about different aspects of the school that you aren't necessarily in all day. And so part of that is learning about the rest of the school, and then the other piece is to actually come up with a consensus rating, which will be represented by a red dot, OK? So I'd like to hear from just a sample of you, of you about why you uh, rated it uh, what you did. So let's start with Sandy and say, tell us what you rated it and give us a rationale for that. All right, so I rated it about a two-ish, a little bit higher than a two, um, mostly because I know that there are a lot of teachers in our building that are really working hard to give a variety of different um, instructional materials and uh, working on vocabulary and different things like that. But at the same time, um, not every single thing that was on here. So um, let's see here. Specifically, some literacy support strategies. I know that we just started doing that with our staff. And we got a lot of great feedback about, wow, these are great strategies, but that was in August. And towards the end, we get wrapped up in what we're doing. So I think some people maybe have drifted away from it a little bit, which is why I don't think we're really where we want to be with classroom instruction. OK. And if you'll remember, this component is made up of four focus points. The first one has to do with the emphasis of literacy, reading, writing, and vocabulary development within each content area. The second one has to do with teachers consistently using classroom routines to involve students. The third one has to do with teachers selecting, modeling, and teaching instructional strategies for kids. And the last one has to do with teachers encouraging students to select and use uh, literacy strategies. So those are the four focus points in that particular component. OK, let's have uh, John tell us a little bit about your rating and uh, why, just a little rationale about why you rated it. For the classroom instruction work? And if you want to pass, you can pass. I, I would love to pass. You would love to pass. How about Pat? Um, I ranked it um, kind of a high one. A high one, or up here. OK. Right. And um, I guess my rationale would be that um, I felt like I could only rank what I, what I knew, and um, I got kind of hung up on the actual focus on literacy, 
and I just I'm just not that aware of that much focus on literacy in my department or in my building, so I went one. Okay, that's exactly right. Um, how about um, let's have Angie? Um, I ranked it like a low two because I think part of the issue that we're having problems with is consistency, like following. So for, for you, the issue is that one of uh, consistency. Uh, is there anybody else that represents uh, departments other than the three that I've already spoken that would like to add to this discussion? Yes, Phil. Uh, as a member of the ELL department, I, I really struggled with the, the a few or some. And I think, I, I mean, if I were really true to myself, I would probably, in classroom instruction, for, through the lens of ELL, put us at a one. But I think that I, I was really hesitant to do that because there are so many teachers throughout the school who I do feel really comfortable with and do a very qual a very good quality job. But like like Andrew was saying, the consistency of that quality. Um, I think sometimes there's a lack of awareness of particular issues. But I think our 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 focus and what our goals are get us from that one to the two, because I think a, a one for me is like, there's no interest almost in doing it. I think all, all the, almost all the teachers have interest, and a few of them are actually doing a really good job. Most of them are trying, and I think that's, that's the struggle for me, is what is a few and what is some. I think you're right, because uh, a one would indicate that there's very little interest and very few people are doing it. And more of a two would indicate that some people are trying out, but as Angie said, it might not be consistent. Okay, is there anybody else that would like to add to the conversation here about why you ranked it? Uh, Stacy? I don't know that I have a lot to add, but I'm from the science department, and I know that within our curriculum, we have many classes where teachers do collaborate and work together, so you do see what several teachers are doing in their classrooms. And I know that we started the year stronger with um, implementing more strategies within reading after the workshop that we did in the fall. And then I know, based on some lunch conversations with some other biology teachers, that they said like, oh yeah, we really kind of got wrapped up in our calendar and our mm -hmm. schedules and what we've done in the past more lately and not <coughs> back to those strategies as, as frequently as we anticipated that we would. Very good, okay, anybody else? In some situations, we if, if it was a smaller group, we would go around and each um, uh, mention what you rated it and why. Uh, but in a large group, a, a representative sample. Okay, so here's a little dot on my finger. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start from one, and I'd like for you to raise your hand where you would feel comfortable the dot being placed, and then put your hand down if you're uncomfortable if I've gone too far. Okay, with the, with the dot placement. Is that clear? It's kind of like a voting wave. <laughs> okay, so so as I move across, I'm sorry. So we Pat? start with them up and then put them down. No, no. You put your hand up. If I reach the point where you would feel comfortable with this dot being placed, and you put your hand down, if I get all the way over here and you say that doesn't represent the way I feel about the school. Okay. Okay. So let's start over here. Raise your hand as I travel, move. Okay, keep your hand up until I get far enough where you're uncomfortable. Mm -hmm, that's almost everybody right here. Kind of a low two. Okay, so go back again. So that looks pretty representative of low two, right about there? Consensual. Okay. You want more central? No, I said consensual. Oh, consensual, it's con yes. It's consensual. So, so this is a, a consensus rating is not an average. So if we had the one that's three and a half and we had the one that's one and a half, we don't take it and make a, a but it's an after discussion. Where would we put the dot after having a consensual discussion? Okay, let's do one more. Um, okay, let's do curriculum alignment. Remember in the slides I talked about um, how, and, and the example I think might have helped you as well. But in the slides I talked about literacy strategies that went across the content areas, and then we had other literacy strategies that were within content areas that were specific to the particular content area. 
this particular uh, component has to do with, have you had discussions within your departments about the literacy demands in that particular department? For example, uh, Stacy, you're a science teacher. What, what do you want kids to be able to do as a 12th grader with a lab report? What do you want kids to be able to do with a lab report in grade 11, grade 10, grade uh, 9, and then even going into the middle school, 8, 7, 6? So this has to do with, have you had discussions about how literacy is developed and builds within the particular um, discipline? OK? So uh, who would like to begin with this? Is it Bryn? Um, I teach at the Alternative East Wilmington, and um, I don't see a lot of curriculum alignment. I'm an English teacher, um, and English is the, the class we have the most of at um, the Alternative <coughs> School. I think in maybe in some of the other subject areas, there's more alignment, but I guess we can move to the after So I give us kind of a warm to do. Okay, remember this has to do with literacy development alignment, not necessarily the alignment of your content area standards. Joe, would you like to add something to it? Um, I'm from the math department, and I mean, the conversation has come up, but as, much, as far as you know, how the lines with our curriculum and literacy, it's not much conversation is going on about it. Um, we're exploring the curriculum, and that's a component. Um, but I would say, So you were low to higher one, okay. Uh, is it Anne? Yeah. Uh, can you <coughs> add to that discussion? Yeah. Uh, I, I gave it like right in the middle between one and two. Right about here? A little bit over two. Oh, yeah. like about a one and a half. Yeah. Okay. And I, I'm just looking at it from my own perspective and what some of us do in the classroom and it's an emerging process, but becoming aware of it. So okay. That's why I put it in. Okay, is anybody else that would like to add? Yes, Bill. So this is, I think, the area where Angie's consistency comment really comes up. Because I think we could all point to individual activities we do in each classes that do focus on literacy, uh, you know, some things that the social studies department does, um, some, some things that are being done in the math department and the science department. But when I look at it as, you know, because I, I, I get to work with the same group of students marching through uh, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, and do I really see those things building on themselves in an organized, aligned way? And my answer to this one is absolutely not. I can find every component, but is it organized and do the students understand that organization? And my answer to that is no, unless that student just has kind of an intrinsic internal already as at the high level. There is very poor scaffolding from course to course, from year to year of uh, uh, intentional buildup. We're doing a really good job with the individual strategies, but are they aligned? I don't think so. And you get to see the school from a student perspective as they go from class to class. And remember my saying earlier, you don't have to be sick to get better. This is almost a, a if you're just now getting into strategy, um, use, use of strategies, this might be kind of almost a second level to begin to talk about how then you build on these strategies within disciplines. So there's lots to do, and so one of the things that you need to do with your goal areas is to think about beginning points as well. Okay, yes, Sandy? Well, and one thing that you might not know is a couple of years ago as a school, we started looking at our curriculum and really asking the questions, what do we want kids to know? And at least in the English department, we are taking a serious look at our courses about building and being organized and not just, you know, like it depends on who you have on your schedule, like you said before, because alignment has been a little bit of an issue. Um, just taking a second look at our curriculum and are we really doing what we always want to do? So at least for our department, and I know some departments are moving through that faster than others, but a lot of the departments are starting to look at that. So yeah, the consistency piece, I think, school-wide, so having the curriculum aligned is one necessary first step, and then looking at the literacy demands and having that roll up there is, is the second step. So, okay, good. Okay, let's, uh, let's do the way. Okay, I'm gonna... Phil, you can't have less than one. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> 
Are you up? I'm the three and a half, so I mean, you're not here. You're not here yet. Okay, so let's go back again. Let's see. All right, raise your hand where we're. Okay, I see. Are you comfortable if I put it at one and a half? Is everybody comfortable with that? Can you live with that, John? No. But can you talk a little bit about why? Well, because I'm looking at, I, I don't know, maybe I've got a different printout from the rest of you. Um, in most departments, course content and literacy development builds by grade level. I mean, in math, that makes sense, doesn't it? You take algebra and then you take whatever comes beyond algebra. Isn't that what we're talking about here? Actually, what we're talking about is the literacy demands that are necessary to be competent reader in math. So, great, but... In, in, in math, I'll tell you, like, there's pre-algebra, there's algebra, and then there's geometry. And the biggest stumbling block my students have is in geometry, because in geometry you get into proofs and you get into uh, stuff like talking about specific figures and theorems, and my students are, are, are really, really lack a lot of those skills that I think are, are the very literacy-based skills in math because I don't see those skills as present. I'm not saying, or as, as organized. I'm not saying they're not there, but they're not as organized in a way that translates to that second level in math specifically. We know that your curriculum is aligned in math, I mean, to build on the other. The question here is, are the literacy sk skills that are necessary for that alignment and moving up in math, are those present and have them have they been discussed? I think that's the issue, John. Yes, Polly. Uh, I guess I was going to add. I'm going to stay away from math, but in terms of English, um, I'm kind of siding with John because I think, particularly in terms of writing, and we do have a number of AP courses, and I think we're doing a pretty good job of helping students develop the writing, reading skills that they need to um, accomplish those. I think if we, you know, they're true, we would have some sophomores who could pass an AP language and comm test, but uh, it's primarily seniors, and I think we boost them to that point. So, so perhaps what we're seeing is that some departments are doing this, which puts it more in the two well, range. I, I look at that and I see the across the content areas. And I would say, I mean, from my opinion, I mean, yeah, the English department is doing probably the best, but I, I would expect them to do so because literacy is a, a much larger component of the curriculum. And I mean, there are, like, I, I think it's science. In many ways, my freshman level biology is the most reading intensive of the, the, the courses. Uh, and, and I don't know that they, they have the reading skills to read the way that biology people would like them to, to read. I, I also see that as Social Studies 9 and World History being a very heavy reading in Social Studies without a lot of the buildup and support to some of the reading. And I grant you, this is, this is my focus through my lens, and it's going to be different for other people. I, I'm just saying, is it aligned? in those other departments, I don't know that it is, especially when you're looking at literacy across the content. I don't want to lose your perspective, so I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to put a <laughs> yellow dot <laughs> right up here about here. Is that all right? Sure. Pauline? And then I'm going to put the red dot over here. the yellow dot. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm going to put the red dot on 1.5. Is that, is that and the, the yellow dot there is to remind you, and I'm going to put a, a times two up there. Okay. To remind you that there are two people that see the uh, school-wide implementation a little differently, okay? So in your discussion, that you can remember that, that there's consensus around here except for two people so that you can remember that, okay? Okay, so that's basically how it goes. What you'll need is you'll need a facilitator for today. Is there anybody that would feel comfortable being a facilitator? for the group. <laughs> Sandy, why don't you do that? Okay, so you'll continue with the dot process. You'll go through here. I think we'll probably finish this. Uh, we'll, I'd like you to finish this piece before you go to lunch, and then we'll talk about what to do after lunch, okay? Great discussions.
Now that you finished your goals, you need to enact them through your team action plan. Be patient, as this can be a challenge as you think through who is responsible for which steps, when and how you will monitor and collect evidence. Take the time to brainstorm. Each goal will have a separate action plan. You need a timeline, noting who is responsible, the resources that you will need to be successful, and complete strategies for implementation. Be specific and note measures of success that you envision you would see once complete. Guidelines for your action plan are critical. Make sure that you're clear and specific. Detail is important and action steps for each goal should revolve around high yet reasonable expectations. Your action plan is a living document that you will revisit and revise throughout the school year. Be sure to share with your staff and school community to get input as you proceed. Remember, you want collective school and community ownership of every goal. As you select common strategies, the National Literacy Project has found some that will ensure there is a common vision and direction on an initiative throughout the school. Common language helps everyone understand what is expected. Students are more able to take ownership when this is approached and used as they consistently hear teachers sharing the same message regarding their literacy development. There are categories of strategies to choose from, but five are recommended most. Building and activating prior knowledge, questioning strategies, taking notes, organize information, build vocabulary. Staff should review, implement, discuss, and decide which strategies will work best. These strategies are all research-based, applicable to any content area, and student-owned. An anticipation guide is teacher-controlled. It's a great tool, but better to use student-controlled strategies to help them increase ownership of their learning. Focus on those that students can use independently and that are versatile enough to introduce skills and build higher order thinking. It is important to know ahead how feedback is going to be gathered from the whole school community. This task cannot fall solely to the literacy team. There must be buy-in from the entire school community and to ensure that all content teachers are on board. Feedback should be collected on the action plan, goals, measures of success, and targeted strategies. Consider a literacy kickoff to share the overview, followed by breaking into teams to discuss and hone. This feedback will then be used to revise and be reshared with all staff so that they can see that their input was heard and enacted. Keep the process transparent. When people know how and why decisions were made and what specific responsibilities they have to accomplish a goal, it leads to increased buy-in by all. As you set the year's agenda, remember that the literacy team is going to be busy throughout the year and all tasks should be placed on a calendar so people are clear on who is doing what, what data will be collected, which classrooms will be demonstration classrooms. Those require substitute teachers so they can leave the room to view another teacher utilizing literary strategies with their students. In-service must be provided and a literacy showcase to highlight the year's focus on literacy is always recommended. This work is done by teachers and the success of students within their literacy development will be noted. A rollout plan always helps to increase communication to keep the culture of building around literacy within school established. Once you have feedback from the entire faculty, it's important to revise to take literary progress further by rewriting the plan based on input from colleagues and on what the data is telling you once it has been analyzed and discussed. Be certain to share so that people know that they were seen and heard. The process is important, and we have been through stage one, getting ready, stage two, assessing your school's literacy status, and stage three, writing the literacy action plan. We are now ready for action. Stage four is implementation. It has three steps. The first step is implementing the action plan, and this could take the entire school year. The second step revolves around troubleshooting any barriers to your goals related to implementation. The third step is monitoring progress to our goals, and you want to be sure to review each of the steps by collecting data related to your clearly written goals. This can be done through several means, but a few ideas include student focus groups, classroom walkthrough observations, focusing on the use of literacy strategies, teacher surveys, student surveys, data collection of literacy progress through assessments used by teachers. Stage five, you've now had one year to implement your plan and goals and monitor those goals. It is good to take a day-to-day -day to analyze, reflect, and revise them. Communicate and celebrate accomplishments of the work that you've done throughout the year. Again, I recommend a literacy showcase as one way to bring this attention to the entire school community. Take time to look for growth and update goals and steps based on what the data is telling you. It's critical to share this information with the faculty so they are aware of what the next steps will be. 
Review your rubrics to see how well you are doing to check for growth and to determine what areas you may need to focus on to gain progress. I have heard one or two teachers say that it is not my job to teach reading. My answer to that is, 